Now we have Peter Abiel with us. Unfortunately, he couldn't come to Switzerland. So he is remotely with us. For him, it's early in the morning in California. Peter is a professor of electricity electrical engineering and computer science, director of the Berkeley Robot Learning Lab, and co-director of the Berkeley All AI Research Lab at the University of California. He's also the co-founder of Covariant AI, a venture-funded startup that aims to teach robot new complex skills. He's best known for his cutting-edge research in robotics and machine learning, particularly in deep reinforcement learning. In his talk, Peter will discuss recent advances that have promised towards learning from less annotation through learning to learn, transfer learning, and unsupervised learning. Peter, good morning. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody in Switzerland. I'm uh, really sorry I couldn't make it in person, but I want to say it was the plan. I had hoped to meet you all in person, but of course, uh, things played out differently. Um, Frank, thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, I was going to first say a little bit about myself, but with this introduction, I think uh, we should skip right over that and dive right into the materials here. And so I want to first First, computer vision classification. Um, as one of the main example domains of where AI has had a lot of impact uh, recently, let's take a look at what it looks like under the hood. In computer vision classification, typically what happens is you have a large neural network, much larger than the one shown on this slide here, but it's just to you know, make it fit on the slide. An image goes in. The image gets processed layer by layer, and out comes a decision of what's in this image. So in this scenario, you'd hope the neural network would say dog. But of course, I mean, if you look at the neural network here sitting in the middle, the way it makes decisions is by each individual neuron making a small contribution, taking in some inputs, processing them, and generating an output. Each individual neuron actually can't do much. But if you, have large, if you have a large enough network, together these neurons can make a decision that is often correct. But they can also make wrong decisions. And the way you get the neural network to make the right decision is to make sure that the strength of the connections between each of these neurons is such that the right decision comes out. So different strengths of connections, also called weights, leads to a different computation happening and a different decision, decision being made. And so neural net training comes down to finding the weights that minimize the difference between the label that it should output and the activation that it actually outputs. And now you might wonder, well, how do we set these weights? Uh, one way to set them could be just you know, try different settings and you know, change a little bit here, change a little bit there, and see what happens. But in practice, these networks have millions of weights. So you can't go in by hand and tweak them. It's completely impractical. So instead, how do we find the correct neural net? We find the correct neural net by feeding in data. So we collect what we call annotated data. We collect images where for each image, we annotate what's in the image. The first row of images, we know our cars. The second row, we know our cats. The third row, we know our dogs and so forth. And then we start with a large neural network where the weights are initialized randomly. So it'll make a pretty arbitrary decision when you feed in the image. But let's say then it says cat, the next thing that happens is a back propagation in the network happens that changes the strengths of the connections so it now knows this is a dog. Then you do this with the next image, next image, next image. And over time, something magical happens. It doesn't just memorize the specific images that it's been shown, it actually starts recognizing the pattern. And then you can feed it a new image it's never seen before, and it'll output very often the right decision of what's in that image. Now, you might wonder what kind of level of performance is achieved with these methods? Well, to, to compare different approaches to solving computer vision problems, there are benchmarks. And probably the most famous benchmark is ImageNet. In ImageNet, the organizers have a secret set of images that nobody else has access to. And that secret set of images, they will take a computer program that you send to them, 
and run it over their secret images and keep track of how often your computer program predicts the correct or the wrong label for what's in those images. And then they will report out an error rate. You can see here in 2010, the best entry in the competition had a 30% error rate on predicting what's in those images. So not that great, actually. This was the best people could do in 2010. 2011, it wasn't much better. This was with, with traditional computer vision. And then in 2016, something, something really special happened. In 2012, out of Jeff Hinton's lab at the University of Toronto, it was shown that instead of using traditional computer vision, by using deep learning, it's possible to cut the error rate in half. Not only that, people saw this, this new approach to solving this kind of problem, switched to it. Essentially, all the next year's entries were using deep learning and further improved on this benchmark. And by now, this competition has actually been retired because human level error rates have been achieved on this competition. To be clear, not human level error rates on everything computer vision, but on this competition where you categorize into a thousand categories under this setting, human level errors have been achieved by deep neural networks, which is around two, three percent. So what else might we be able to do? This was image classification. How about image captioning? Well, it turns out Microsoft Coco is an image captioning challenge where now um, the challenge is given an image, generate a sentence about that image. And what we see on this slide here is images that the neural network had never seen before and was able to caption automatically. For example, man in black shirt is playing guitar. Or bottom left, girl in pink dress is jumping in air. By no means can this be done at human level, but this really works surprisingly well. Another very interesting thing that happened is this result came out in 2015. And the moment this result came out, it came out of eight research labs at the same time. And that's really interesting that all of a sudden eight research labs, it was out of Berkeley, Stanford, Montreal, Toronto, NYU, Google, Baidu, Facebook, eight research labs got the result at the same time. Why was that? It was because of the Microsoft Coco dataset that was, that was released a little bit before that. Once the dataset existed, the world leading researchers were able to use that dataset to train a neural network, not from image to label, but now what the new dataset gave us, image to caption. Now, not just an image recognition, similar thing happened in speech recognition. Traditional approaches to speech recognition were flatlining in performance. And actually out of the same lab in Toronto, Jeff Hinton's group showed that with deep learning, you can go right through that and get much better performance than was possible before. What does it mean here, deep learning? It's again a deep neural network. Input here is a sequence of numbers corresponding to the air pressure. Output is a transcription of what's being said. Something similar happened in machine translation. In fact, Jeff Hinton and his students um, ended up at Google where they built similar capabilities to improve machine translation. And this was put into production at Google. And that is what, if you use Google Translate now, it's powered by deep neural networks trained on pairs of sentences. The training examples consist of in goes a sentence in one language, out a sentence in another language. What we really have here is a change in programming paradigm. The way we used to program is by writing lines of code. But for the AI problems that we're considering here, that actually give pretty bad performance. The new way to solve these problems, and the only way to solve these problems, in fact, but the kind of new approach people are following, is through deep learning, which people are starting to call software 2.0 as the new generation of software development. In software 2.0 or deep learning, you don't write lines of code to you know, have a process for recognizing what's an image, or you don't write the lines of code to do speech recognition or machine translation. 
Instead, you put down a gigantic neural network, again, much larger than the one shown here. And that gigantic neural network is then trained from examples to start to recognize a pattern. Once that's happened, effectively, the program lives inside the neural network. You, th you can think of each layer in the network as doing parallel processing and consecutive layers are doing serial processing. And so in goes some data, out comes a prediction, and this has been working really, really well. Now, let's take a look under the hood. This is actually inspired from biological neurons. What does a biological neuron do? It, here is one, one neuron diagram. So it'll take in through its dendrites some input signals, which could come from photoreceptors initially in the eye, or it could come from other neurons that have already done some processing in earlier uh, layers. Then that signal is processed inside the nucleus of this neuron. And then based on that, it'll potentially fire or not fire and send that signal over the axon that then goes out to many other neurons who can then process that signal and take it to wherever it needs to go. This is a biological neuron. Obviously, there's no full understanding of how the brain works, not even of how a single neuron works, but it is a rough model of some approximation of what goes on inside biological neurons. And this has been the inspiration, this approximate model has been the inspiration for building artificial neurons. And so mathematically speaking, an artificial neuron takes in input signals, x0, x1, x2. Maybe those are pixel values. Maybe those are uh, pressure uh, readings. Or maybe those are signals coming from previous neurons. Then the signals get weighted by W0, W1, W2. A weighted sum is computed. So this is just a, a linear, linear function here. Then an activation function gets applied that you can think of as, for example, squashing. You have this linear function, the output gets squashed between negative one and plus one to bound the amplitude for your output. And then it goes on an output axon that goes to the next layers. All right, then, now, of course, a single neuron cannot do a whole lot of complicated things, but you put it in a much larger neural network where together these neurons can do very uh, complicated things. And you might wonder how complicated is it what these neural networks can do? Can it capture anything I wanted to capture? Let's say you had some images you wanted to recognize cats versus dogs. How do you know if a neural net can do this or not? Well, it turns out there's something called a universal function approximation theorem. This theorem is actually pretty old. Um, and in kind of simple words, what it says is that given any continuous function, f of x, so x is the input, f of x is what generates the output. If a two-layer neural network has enough hidden units, enough might be a lot, but if it has enough hidden units, then there is a choice of weights that allow it to closely approximate f of x. So this is saying that if you want to capture a pattern, and there's actually many of these theorems that are uh, roughly equivalent, if you want to capture a pattern in your data, as long as you make your neural network large enough, it is capable of capturing that pattern. Of course, you still need to feed in enough data to teach it to capture the pattern, but if it's large enough and you have enough data, it can uh, internalize that pattern. Now, if I took a, we'll take a look at some history of all this, um, it turns out people were building neural networks already in the 1950s. Then the algorithm that trains the neural network back propagation was invented in the 80s, still in use today. And then in computer vision, the neural net architectures, how the neurons are wired up, um, the convolutional network architecture was invented in the late 80s. And so you might wonder, you know, is this deep learning thing really like five years old, 40 years old, 60 years old? What's the deal here? Um, well, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, it's a subjective answer. Obviously, it's 60, 60 years old, but you know, how come um, this is all happening now? Why is it happening now? And did it not happen um, in the 50s? Well, the enabling factors have been the amount of data and compute we have available today, which was not available back in the 50s, combined with AI innovation. And to better understand that, on the horizontal axis here, we have amount of data. This is, of course, a cartoon diagram. 
But what this is saying is that as the amount of data grows, deep learning will keep doing better and better and better. Whereas more traditional approaches, because they don't have this universal expressiveness, at some point they will start saturating performance. Initially, often traditional approaches did better because they have a lot more human engineering in them. And so human expertise is going into them combined with some data to try to solve a problem. But what the current trends are showing is that we're now starting to get into the data regimes where we have data that we can outperform the combination of human engineering and small amount of data by just collecting more data and letting, letting the neural net absorb it all. Now, are we done given this result? Um, for some problems, yes. In fact, you could call us done. You just collect enough data, corresponding inputs and outputs, set up a very large neural network, make sure you have some compute infrastructure, and you train the neural network to recognize the pattern. But there's something subtle here going on. It requires a lot of data, and often getting enough data annotated is difficult and expensive. And so we're not really done in many cases. And in fact, you can build you could, the cost of this can be prohibitive. For example, one of the latest Silicon Valley unicorns, which means a billion dollar plus company, is a company that all it does is annotating data. That's its business. So by just annotating other people's data, you can become a billion dollar business showing that, you know, obviously it's not free to get your data annotated. There's a lot of effort and uh, so forth that goes into this that you might have to pay for. So, can we learn with less labels? Because that's really the bottleneck here. The data is easy to collect as, as long as it's just the inputs X, but then annotating it with the corresponding output Y tends to be the work. Can we avoid that? Um, the answer is yes. There has been a lot of progress in the last few years through data augmentation, semi-supervised learning and unsupervised learning on getting systems to work with less annotated data. Let's take first a look at data augmentation. So what is data augmentation? Data augmentation is about enlarging your data set. Maybe you collected this one image of a cat. And then instead of training a neural network based on just this one image, you say, hey, what if I you know, modify this image a little bit by rotating it in various ways? It's still a cat. And you can write a, some code, some Python code, for example, that will just rotate the image a little bit. You don't have to annotate these new images, you know it's still a cat. So you annotate an image once, and then from that image, you generate many other images. Um, in AlexNet, the data augmentation that happened, uh, AlexNet is the big breakthrough in 2012, consisted of image translations, so moving the image around a little bit, horizontal reflections, and also altering the intensities of the RB, RGB channels was important for the success there. Now, this data augmentation uses a very wide range of uh, ideas, as you can see in this table here. So many, many different things can be done to your images uh, in today's data augmentation. Now, you might wonder, do we need to do them all and so forth? And it might be expensive computation to do them all. And so indeed, actually, Google came up with a scheme called AutoAugment. And what AutoAugment does, it cleverly chooses which data augmentations to apply when during the training. And if you look at the table of results here of AutoAugment, you'll see that it, Google showed that with AutoAugment, you can outperform all previous methods on various standard benchmarks. Here we have CIFAR, and then here on, on um, with the next one, we have ImageNet. And we see in both cases that data augmentation allowed outperforming past methods. No need to design new neural nets, no new algorithms, just data augmentation. More clever data augmentation was enough to become the state-of-the-art model. In fact, uh, very close to human performance here, and since then, uh, human performance has, has, has actually, this case was, a, was outperforming human performance already. So, now Google did this with an enormous amount of compute. One thing we did at Berkeley, uh, a little bit after that, is a thousand times less compute. And so we're able to make this something that anybody can run on their own GPU rather than needing a massive cluster to do this. So that's one way we've been able to learn from less labels. And it's worth noting that in, this is very popular in computer vision. 
speech, re speech recognition uh, to this kind of data augmentation in natural language processing, another very important application domain. Uh, it's proven uh, harder uh, than in, in vision and, and speech to come up with these ideas, but um, I'm sure people will come up with the right ideas uh, that will do this there too. So data augmentation is one trick. It's essentially saying I'm doing supervised learning still, so I'm not changing my algorithm, but I'm just turning my existing data set into a thousand times bigger data set without needing to do any additional annotation effort. Another idea that's been very powerful is semi-supervised learning. In semi-supervised learning, as we look at this picture here to kind of get the intuition, we have a data set. And we know, let's say the data set consists of all cats and dogs. So we know there's two categories. And one is noted yellow, the other one is noted, denoted blue, but only some small subset has been annotated with cat or dog. The others have not. But if you look at this picture, you can guess which ones should be yellow, which ones should be blue. Why is that? Because the ones that belong in the same category tend to be close together. And you can chain that together. So even for some of the um, transparent circles here that are not directly next to a yellow or a blue, you can chain your reasoning through this graph to see, you know, if I go through close by neighbors, where do I end up with a yellow or a blue one? That's the intuition behind semi-supervised learning. You can effectively propagate what the labels you have onto unlabeled images or speech or text and so forth. The uh, most effective, I mean, there's a lot of work in this space, but the most effective method right now is called noisy student. What happens in noisy student? You first train what we call a teacher model. So what this means is you have your labeled data, which might be only 10% of your data or even 1% of your data, you train your neural network on that data. That's called the teacher model. Then you use that neural network to guess the labels on the other data. Is that gonna be perfect? No, by no means. If that were perfect, you, know, you would have no benefit anymore from the other data. But on some of the other data, it's gonna be good because it's near the original data that was labeled. And so you get some signal propagation there. These are called pseudo labels. They're not human provided labels. They're automatically provided by this first network that you train. Then the trick people play is they say, I'm now gonna retrain a new network on both the human level data and this pseudo label data. This is gonna be a larger network and I'm gonna introduce a lot of noise in the training. So it needs to be very robust to try to fit those labels, including the pseudo labels. Once that's been done, you make that the new teacher and eat. And it turns out that that under the hood leads to the process I just described where the labels will gradually propagate out from the images that you had a human annotate to the images that have not been annotated, but now over time get annotated. Then if you look at the experiments here that were done, um, there's some details on the noise and architecture, but the experiments are run on ImageNet, which is the standard data set for image recognition benchmarking, which has about 1.3 million images. Those are all annotated. Then an unlabeled data set was collected, which has 300 million unlabeled images, so a lot more unlabeled images. And this process was run. So let's take a look at the results here. If you look at this graph, noise is doing is the red curve on top. Higher is better because vertical axis is accuracy. And we see it consistently outperforms a neural network called EfficientNet that's trained on just the 1 million labeled examples. So the 1 million labeled examples were augmented with 300 million unlabeled examples, no additional human annotation effort. Just run this noisy student algorithm and you get a direct boost in performance. So we've seen now two methods for how we can learn with less labels. We've seen data augmentation and semi-supervised learning. A third one, of how we can learn with less labels is purely unsupervised learning. So what is the main idea behind unsupervised learning? Well, it's transfer with multi-headed networks. So what does that look like? I have a neural network with many layers. I have input, for example, image or speech or maybe uh, text. And that gets processed, but now at some point there's a split in the network because I'm trying to solve two tasks instead of just one task. So maybe um, 
what, what could be these tasks? Uh, let's take a look at, at the next diagram here. In this case, task one is a unsupervised task, one for which we do not provide any human annotation. And I'll say some examples for this later, but, and then the second task is gonna be the real task that we care about. So it's very interesting. We set up a, a single neural network that's gonna solve two problems that are related. And the hope is that by solving two problems that are related, that we can solve both problems better. And very specifically in this setting here, the real task is one we care about, but by sharing the neural network with another task that's unsupervised, meaning does not require any human annotation to provide data for it, we are going to see better performance on task two. By the way, this has been the dream in unsupervised learning for decades. And it's only in the last year that this has really started working and it's a dramatic change in how we can solve real world problems by the fact that this now works and used to not work. So let's take a look at NLP. So transfer from unsupervised learning in NLP. Task one could be predict the next word. So a lot of text from the internet and the task would predict the next word. And then the other work um, would be um, doing the task we really care about. So here's an example of this in action. Open the eyes GPT-2. The top two lines are the prompt. It's what it's shown, and it's supposed to complete this. And if we read the text here, indeed, it's completed this quite successfully. This is a credible um, news article. Uh, let's take a look at another example of next word prediction. Here is you know, a more crazy uh, prompt. Recycling is good for the world. No, you could not be more wrong. Um, how might it complete that? Well, here is what it says. And so it's learned this from reading a lot of text on the internet. Now, the beauty is after it's learned to predict next word, we now get a little bit of data on another problem and train the same neural network with that other output branch for the other problem. So let's take a look at some benchmarks for this. So one benchmark is the Winograd schema challenge. It's a very subtle language understanding challenge. The trophy doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it is too large. The question is, what is it referring to? Well, it's referring to trophy because the trophy is too large to fit into the suitcase. But what if we now change just one word in that sentence, make large into small? Now it is a suitcase because the suitcase is too small for the trophy to fit into it. And so this Winograd schema challenge really challenges your neural net or other AI system to understand the semantics of the sentence, not just do some simple grammar of, oh, I see the word it, it, it probably refers to the nearest by noun or something like that and find the nearest by noun because that's not gonna work here. You need to understand that just a one word change affects what it refers to. As another benchmark here on this, um, this slide with question answering, who wrote the book, The Origin of Species? Species? Correct answer is Charles Darwin. How did this neural net know that? It's been printing so much text that it has learned to predict that if the sentence it's faced with is a question, who wrote the book, The Origin of Species? The next thing that tends to come is the words Charles Darwin. What's the largest state in the US by land mass? It says California, that's wrong, should be Alaska. So it's just an example included here to show that this is by no means perfect, right? This is not a perfect system, but it's, it's surprisingly good. Now, if we look at the whole table of benchmarks, and that's really what's so interesting here, what happened is in the past, people will look at these individual challenges. We saw two of them, but there's many more shown in this table, and would do supervised learning for each of these challenges and see how well it works. And there is records, the previous records. Then OpenAI showed that by first training the neural net on predicting the next word in a document on you know, many, many documents, millions of examples, but you don't need to annotate anything. You just download. So it's unsupervised learning, no explicit supervision needed to train a neural network. You just download text. You first train a network for that. They give it a second output branch. Train that for... Um, so you've, you now train a network for that second task, but it's been pre-trained on the first task. It can outperform any of the previous records, all these tasks. And so this shows that the new normal in natural language processing is to always pre-train on 
just text, which is freely available. I mean, you need compute to process it, but you don't need any human labor for annotation. And then you train on the task you actually care about. Now you might wonder, how does that all scale? Um, so the graphs here on the horizontal axis, the number of parameters in your neural network, the vertical axis is accuracy on five different tasks. And what we see here is that consistently accuracy keeps going up as the neural network gets bigger. And so this is an indicator that we should make our neural networks even bigger than they are today if we want to keep improving performance. You might say, well, why not? Why not make even bigger? Well, um, the amount of compute you need starts growing quickly as you want to have larger and larger neural networks. So effectively, this is now bottlenecked by amount of compute you have available rather than bottlenecked by the amount of data you're able to annotate. What I just described was GPT-2 from OpenAI. GPT-3, which is a bigger version, just came out two weeks ago, even better results than all this. In parallel, something was developed at Google called BERT. In BERT, the idea is to also predict the word, but instead of predicting the next word, you're gonna take text that you download and mask out words, and then has to fill it in. You might say, that's not that different. And in fact, it seems a little easier. You get to fill it in rather than predicting the next one. Uh, you can look at both sides of that word and see what might be in the middle. Indeed, it's, it's sometimes an easier task, but it turns out that pre-training on this has given the best performance. Uh, it trains the network to more fully understand this, the full sentence coming from both sides rather than just coming from the left. And so if we look at some bird examples here, um, we have sentence A, the man went to the store. Sentence B, he bought a gallon of milk. Now, the supervised task here would be, is this a good next sentence or not a good next sentence? And the answer is yes, it's a good next sentence. And so we start with training left out word prediction. That's task one in the network. And we add a new branch to the network, task two, on this kind of problem. But we do provide some, in this case, again, easy annotation on the left. Um, you can just um, download sequence of sentences. On the right, not that hard either because you can just pick random sentences and most likely they're not good fits with each other. And then it starts understanding this. Let's take a look at the glue benchmark results with BERT. It is often called the kind of BERT revolution in the sense that um, if you look at this benchmark here, it's consistently outperforming previous results on every single task. These are very different NLP tasks and every time it's best to first train a BERT neural network and followed by training on the second task. And in fact, BERT within one year was incorporated into Google search. So many of you, probably all of you have already used uh, the BERT search algorithm uh, or the Google search powered. What does it mean to use BERT inside Google search? When you type a sentence, that sentence or whatever you type into Google, a sequence of words will be processed by the neural network into a representation that captures the underlying meaning in some sense of your sentence. And then the search is run against that underlying meaning rather than literally the characters you typed. And so there might be multiple ways to express the same thing. It'll lead to the same results coming back. And this is, I would say, quite unique that a, research, a purely academic in some sense research result comes out and within one year it's used in production, you know, every day, 24 seven, worldwide, um, but that's how big a deal this uh, breakthrough has been uh, that has been pushed through and it's, it's used in many, many NLP applications today. In fact, a lot of people call this the NLP BERT revolution. The downstream tasks here on this table, on the, the columns correspond to downstream tasks, different natural language processing tasks, like is, is this a good uh, next sentence? Is a sentiment positive or negative about uh, in this article? Um, or maybe it's, you know, is this, um, what is the word it referred to and so forth. You see all the rows here are actually occupied by BERT and then new versions of BERT. Uh, sometimes larger versions, sometimes um, more competition efficient versions, trained slightly differently and so forth. But ultimately this is all BERT that is dominating the entire leaderboard in natural language processing. So very, very big change. Now, how about computer vision? It turns out this big revolution first happened in language processing, but we can do the same thing in principle in computer vision. We have a neural network. 
we have one task and another task. The first task could maybe be fill in a patch, which is something we don't need to provide supervision for, because once we have an image, we can remove a patch, just like in BERT, we remove a word, and then train to fill in the patch, and task two could be the thing we care about, predicting cat versus dog. So what are some things people have tried in computer vision? One is solving jigsaw puzzles. So task one would be you're given the nine patches on the left, and your job is to turn that into the configuration on the right. This is a um, hard problem, but neural nets can be trained to do this. Or rotation prediction. This one was actually, rotation prediction was actually invented in uh, Google Switzerland and was a big breakthrough. It looks very, very simple. You know, you take an image, you just need to predict what has been rotated and then how much. Um, it turns out that if you first ask task one, train your neural network to predict the rotation, and then task two, something else, like is it a cat, a dog, a bird, and so forth, this is actually really powerful. And again, no human annotation needed. You can just download images and you can programmatically rotate them and you know what you did. You can also do predicting the missing patch. Uh, that's another example of task one. So here we see some in-painting. Uh, in computer vision, the first real clear out. Got it. I hear somebody else talking. I don't know if that's intentional or not. Um, so in computer vision, um, in computer vision, um, the first big breakthrough happened late 2019 with contrastive predictive coding. So what we have there is, again, this kind of graph where you want to be higher up in this graph. And as a function of the number of labels we have, the blue curve, which uses this kind of auxiliary task one, outperforms the red curve, which only uses uh, labeled data. Then that was the first time it happened fall 2019. Then this year, um, breakthroughs happened to something called Simclear and Moco, which are effectively simplified versions of this idea that's on this slide here. Simclear and Moco, um, you have an image of, for example, of a dog, and then you would turn it into two images of the same dog, and you would say, these are coming from the same image, and they need to be different as the neural net encodes them from, let's say, a cat. Once you apply Simclear with a linear classifier, as we see in this, uh, can we go to the next next slide? Uh, one more. In Simclear with a linear classifier, um, we see that we can do as well as supervised learning. What that means is that we can just do Simclear, which is this kind of contrastive learning approach on a lot of unlabeled data and then get labeled examples. All we need to do is linear classifier. It's enough to win out and this got scaled up um, with, um, so in this next graph here, we see the scaled up version. And uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, and so what we see here is that if you have a very large amount, uh, a very large neural network, um, for now in vision, in this graph here, we can see that Simclear plus linear classifier approaching the supervised uh, results but we see also that's still going up. And so we expect that soon enough, this will also start crossing over and have better performance than just supervised learning. One quick side note here, I've shown to you um, results of unsupervised learning where we first train on one task and then another task. Sometimes people just care about unsupervised learning in itself. It's often called generative models in that context. And in generative models, a network is set up to go from, not from image to code, but the other way around. So when we run this animation here, um, what we'll see is that um, the network gets flipped and we go from code to uh, image. And so you can actually train neural networks to start from some initial images that it generates and over training time, it'll learn to generate um, new images that look realistic. Can we go to the next slide? Um, next one, next one. And so what we see here is this learning Peter? to generate images. Peter, this is uh, Frank speaking, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so sorry, I have, to, uh, I have to stop you because we were running out of time. Uh, no worries. I, 
I know um, you still had some slides to go, but we have to hand out our awards. still had two awards. slides, indeed. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Got it. But thank you very much for joining us today, and I hope next year you get to be here uh, in person. Oh, I sorry. Hope so too. Uh, we have thank two more. We, we have two questions. I hear there's still time for the questions. So let's let's head to the questions. Do you have any ideas for data augmentation not related to images? Yeah. So in speech, data augmentation is also uh, done quite easily. You can essentially transfer the signal, make it run faster, slower. But you can add noise in the background, so you can record speech that you have transcribed, and then you can overlay background noises to make the neural net much more robust. In natural language processing, it's been a little less clear how to do it, um, but hopefully people come up with tricks there too sometime soon. And one final question. What about hybrid approaches that combine humanly curated knowledge graphs? Yeah, so the, there's a lot of knowledge out there that's a lot more structured, obviously, than just uh, processing text. Um, there is something new that's becoming very popular, which is called graph neural networks. And in graph neural networks, you can have these graphs of knowledge where concepts are connected to each other, but they're processed by a network that's not set up the same way that most current popular networks are set up, but they're structured to match the graph that's already in your knowledge base. And they can actually reason about these concepts in fairly sophisticated ways. And so that is starting to happen, and it's starting to show some great signs of life, actually. Thank you very much, Peter. And once again, sorry for interrupting you, but we're running out of time here. Uh, all the best uh, to no you in California. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day there. Thanks. Bye, Peter.